Hello all, welcome to our second fall green gardening class. My name is Dawn Calciano. I'm a conservation coordinator with the city of Davis. Also on here is uh, Jennifer Gilbert. She's my fellow conservation coordinator. I focus primarily on water conservation and she focuses on all things solid waste and recycling. Uh, so we do, we have had one uh, fall green gardening class already, backyard composting on October 20th. That presentation is now posted on our greenerdavis.org website and on our Greener Davis YouTube channel. Uh, next week, we have a tree selection, watering and care, which we're doing in partnership with Tree Davis. And on November 17th, leak detection and the city's customer water use portal, which is called Aquahawk. Next slide. So we'll jump right into our sustainable landscaping presentation. So some considerations for sustainable landscaping are the environmental benefits. Uh, typically sustainable landscaping will require less water, less maintenance, generate less yard waste, reduce water runoff from the site, uh, has the potential to improve wildlife habitat and foster healthy soils. So it's something to consider when planning your landscape or multiple factors to consider are your landscape goals. What is your goal with what you would like to achieve with the landscape on your property? Would you like to attract pollinators, have color year round, grow food, um, have a low maintenance landscape, create a relaxing sanctuary for yourself or your family or other potential um, landscape considerations or goals that you have? Uh, what you wish to accomplish or achieve um, will determine the plant selection for the property, the irrigation layout, and the maintenance needs. So stormwater considerations um, when you're planning your landscape or making changes or modifications to your landscape is consider ways to reduce water and retain rainwater on site, can redirect downspouts to landscape areas uh, where rainwater can then filter through the landscape and infiltrate into the soil, incorporate rain gardens, dry creek beds, or vegetated swales. And what you see here is a vegetated swale. It slows the speed of water and can help reduce erosion on site. You can also incorporate rain barrels into your design. Um, rain barrels are um, in the winter time, like with the rains we just had, primarily you're, you would use uh, either store that water or use it for plants indoors potentially. Um, in the spring, if we get um, rain, which we hope we will, you could save some of that rain to be able to, that um, rainwater storage to be able to use that kind of going into the shoulder season into the summer to provide some of those landscape needs in warmer weather. Some other um, stormwater considerations are permeable pavers. They allow water to soak into the ground, unlike your typical kind of pavement or um, concrete wet that doesn't allow the water to infiltrate. There's a variety of materials available, pavers, gravel, and sand. And plan to keep the soil and the mulch on site. You can see a good example of that on the screen um, where you see the border that's around the edge of the landscape area. It keeps um, the soil and mulch from being washed or blown away. Um, have mulch soils and other supplies delivered to your yard or driveway. We want to avoid piles on the street. Um, as you saw with like the recent rain, everything kind of ends up down near the um, storm drains and that water is not treated and that all of that debris can end up blocking the storm drains and causing localized flooding. Uh, cover piles in case of uh, wind or rain. We can uh, move on to soils. If we have questions as we go, we can pause at times and take some questions. Um, for soils, uh, topsoil may have been compacted. If it came, especially because a lot of uh, soils for new developments come from another location and then they're compacted on the site. Uh, you want to in consider incorporating compost, manures, other natural fertilizers into your soil. Um, healthy soils can feed and nurture your plants. And check the soil moisture at root level before you water. It may look dry on top, but especially with a lot of the clay soils we have in the area, they retain water for a longer period of time. So you can use a screwdriver to um, check how, um, if the soil is moist at root level. You can also use kind of an inexpensive uh, soil moisture sensor that you can put in for potted plants. You can also use that in your yard or landscape that will give you an idea of how moist the soil still is. 
You want to allow water to infiltrate rather than run off. Um, clay soils also have runoff pretty quickly, so you may have to set your irrigation timers for fairly short periods of time and do what we call cycle and soak, where you run it for a few minutes, let the water infiltrate, an hour or so later run it for a couple more minutes. Next slide. There are um, three main soil types. There's also combinations of the different soil types, but sand, silt, and clay. Uh, there's soil survey data that's available through the Natural Resource Conservation Service and uh, the UC Davis California Soil Resource Lab. Uh, that soil information will give you an idea of what the soil is like for your particular area of town. You can also do soil testing, especially if you have concerns or you've had issues with your soil or plants surviving. You can take that sample to a professional lab. You can also do a soil sedimentation test to get an idea of your soil type or determine soil texture by what they call the field test, where you're basically rolling a ribbon of soil to see how quickly it falls apart or holds together it can help you determine what type of soil you have. So uh, next consideration in your landscape are your plant choices. You want to choose plants that are appropriate to your soil and microclimate. You definitely want to watch for spacing. You want to plan for the mature plant size, especially if you're doing shrubs or trees. You want to make sure that the size of when you're planting is that you're not planting other things too close for the size that that mature plant will eventually be. Uh, choose low water use plants and consider natives that are um, local to our area. Also consider benefits like pollinators and if you'd like to bring pollinators on site. Uh, remember that even low water use plants need regular water during establishment and that's typically like one to two years that you're going to need some regular water for those plants to really be established. Um, a place to find out what those watering requirements are and how a plant, um, a particular plant that you're interested in um, might kind of fit into that watering scheme from low water use to a high water use. You can use Wuckels. It's the water use classification of landscape species. And we do have um, links that we'll provide at the end to these resources and we'll be posting this presentation online. So if you are interested, you don't need to be writing down the links. We'll make sure that information gets out to you. Uh, there's also uh, planting plans and resources. There's quite a few sites that are available online. We've just listed a few here, but planting considerations kind of go back to when you're talking about your overall goals. Uh, look at uh, planting plans. There's ones for color, low maintenance, wildlife friendly, native plants. There's a lot of different options for plans. You want to make sure that the plans that you're looking at are appropriate for kind of our Sacramento region, that you're not looking at necessarily a planting plan for Southern California or an other area of the United States that might have plants that aren't quite as appropriate for our area. Uh, you want to group plants by hydrozone. So this is if you're either redoing part of your landscape or you're uh, designing your landscape from scratch. You want to group plants by hydrozone. You want to put plants with the same water needs on the same valve or irrigation area. In particular, you don't want to have high water use plants mixed in with low water use plants because you'll need to water for the water needs of your highest water plant. And that'll mean that you're really overwatering those low water use ones and potentially killing them because they can't handle that amount of moisture. Uh, there's planting plans and resources available for the UC Davis Arboretum. Uh, the Calscape Garden Planner, which there's an image uh, on the site here where you put in information it gives you um, options for native plants for your garden. And the um, UC Davis Arboretum site, you'll see one of their planting plans, their low maintenance plan here. And there's also the Homeowner's Guide to a Water Smart Landscape that's available online. Those are just a couple of the resources. We have a lot more resources on our helpful links on our water conservation pages. We can jump into irrigation planning. Unless we have some questions, we could go ahead and take a couple of questions here. Just looking to see if we have any. And Don, I don't know if we covered um, how to ask questions in the class, and I apologize if we kind of rushed through that. Um, if you have a question and you'd like to ask it during the webinar, um, you can use the raise hands feature um, to indicate that you'd like to answer, like ask a question. Um, you can also um, send an email, and I forgot to put it on the slide, so my apologies. You can send an email to um, jgilbert at cityofdavis.org. That's J G I L B E R T at cityofdavis.org. So we can answer your questions during the um, presentation in case you don't have a microphone. 
So I don't uh, currently see any raised hands. So go ahead and jump into uh, irrigation planning. Uh, if you're installing a new irrigation system, keep your as-built plans for the irrigation. It would be very helpful in the future if you're doing maintenance to know here's where there might be different connections or different valves within your system so that if you do have any issues with the irrigation or leaks in the system, you're able to locate those and not have to dig up other areas potentially of your property trying to locate any irrigation issues. Uh, determine the type of irrigation that's best for your landscape. Uh, there are differing needs, depending on if you're talking about, um, uh, you know, watering turf, where you might need sprinkler spray irrigation, trees, you don't really want to use sprinkler and spray irrigation because they can damage the tree trunk. Uh, if you have um, low water use plants, then typically uh, drip is, a, is an option for those type of plants applying water just to the plant area. Uh, also consider pressure regulation, too high or too low of pressure within your system uh, can cause issues. Um, it can cause uh, issues with malfunctioning sprinkler heads, drip emitters popping off if the irrigation is too high. Um, it, you may find in your system that you have an area that doesn't get much water because the pressure is not regulated and it's too low. So it's not making it to the last sprinkler or the end of your drip line. So if you're updating your irrigation system, consider what we call mash precipitation rate MPR nozzles. Those are a um, type of nozzle that uh, matches the, the rate that the water is, is coming out for, um, for that irrigation nozzle. And it matches it to um, two different arcs within your system. So you have one that's spraying like half of an area and another one that sprays completely around. So like 360 degrees, it'll match it to your one that's 180 degrees or 90 degrees. It makes it so that you're getting the right amount of water to the different areas within your system. I also consider uh, pre pressure regulation is available within spray bodies now, so it can help improve in, uh, performance. So each spray body for the irrigation has its own pressure regulation within it. Uh, for drip, uh, pressure compensating emitters, that way you don't get those uh, drip emitters that actually fly off and then you've got just a stream of water shooting out of your drip system. Uh, for, uh, it can deliver the even flow of water even if you have changes in pressure across your line. So we just mentioned uh, drip irrigation. There's some advantages to converting to drip. And um, looks like we our screen may have gone blank here for a second. So we'll try to get that back up. Um, but I can continue a little bit with the drip irrigation. So with uh, drip irrigation, advantages are uh, more efficient water use if it's used properly, uh, provides water directly to the plants or near the plant roots, can minimize evaporation, uh, which is a big issue in the summertime here in our area. Uh, promotes a good soil water environment. It, you avoid a lot of the overspray and runoff. Um, some disadvantages, emitters may clog. It's not as easy to see when things aren't working properly and can be damaged by animals, insects, and humans. People often, if their um, drip is underneath mulch or other areas, they might dig into it accidentally, not realize that there's a break there because water's not coming to the surface. Um, if you might not notice that there's an emitter, if you know that has an issue, is clogged or is popped off if it's underneath a plant and it's hitting that plant and not really running off. Um, so there's definitely, you, there is maintenance involved with having drip lines as well as having the more typical kind of spray sprinkler irrigation systems. So irrigation timers, um, you want to check your irrigation system, your timer, replace batteries as needed, even brief power outages with um, most of the older um, irrigation timers can cause your timer to reset. And sometimes it'll be on a new turf watering schedule. So you'll suddenly see that you've got watering, you know, five days a week when you normally water, say two or three. Um, run the system briefly to look for uh, broken sprinkler heads and issues with any um, irrigation lines or drip lines. Consider installing a weather-based irrigation controller. Um, a weather-based irrigation controller, there's, um, uh, we have links from our website, but there's a lot of information through WaterSense for WaterSense certified controllers. Those are controllers that have been tested to provide the water savings that they, um, that they say that they will. They've been tested to show that they actually do provide those water savings. 
a, in addition to a weather-based controller, or if um, you have a standard controller and you're happy with your controller, consider adding a rain sensor. That kind of works like an interrupt switch. So um, once, if there's enough rain, it'll turn off the controller and kind of interrupt the controller schedule until it dries out enough, but it's not showing rain anymore. Um, and so with how we have sporadic rain here in our area, rain sensor can be a really helpful tool and they're typically relatively inexpensive. Uh, be mindful of watering restrictions. We do have new um, watering restrictions starting November 1st for Davis. It'll be uh, two days per week restrictions for odd even addresses. Um, odd addresses can water Tuesday and Saturday and even addresses Wednesday, Wednesday and Sunday. This applies to sprinkler spray irrigation only, not to your drip systems or other types of hand watering or other irrigation. Uh, can monitor your water use with Aquahawk. Uh, we have another uh, presentation on Aquahawk on November 17th, where we'll talk about the system and how you can use it to check for leaks. Uh, but monitoring your water usage with Aquahawk, there's information on that and on the watering restrictions at the savedaviswater.org site. So please uh, check that out so you're familiar with the restrictions that are coming up and how to uh, register for Aquahawk to be able to get a better idea of your water usage. And Don, I would also add, you know, mm -hmm. irrigation timers can be really challenging things to work with sometimes, yes. <laughs> depending on the type of, of timer that you have, they can be really complicated. Um, as Don mentioned on um, the city's website, um, there's ways to kind of look up the different times of timers and look for instruction manuals and see if you can figure it out. Um, if you do want to go and replace your timer, um, the weather-based irrigation ones, like she's saying, are fantastic. They even have ones that are, um, that connect to your cell phone so that you can have an app on your cell phone mm -hmm. to control your, your timer, which makes it much simpler than yes. trying to stand there in the garage or outside and, and twiddle those dials and figure things out. So there's different types of timers. And it, if you really want to get into, you know, doing all the rain sensing things, and, and especially if you're trying to, you know, make sure that your, your timer is only going off with the watering restrictions that the city will have, um, you know, making sure that you understand how your timer works is going to be key. Yes, definitely echo what Jennifer just said. There's um, uh, timers can be very complicated and they're all so different, but there's not just good standard advice that we're able to give when someone calls in with a, you know, a timer issue. There are certain things that we can recommend people check, but um, the best information is going to be going online. Most of the manuals for the irrigation timers are available online. And um, most of the major manufacturers will also have um, kind of helpful videos and other things for timers and for choosing um, spray nozzles and your irrigation layout for sites. Most of the major manufacturers have um, their version of kind of um, irrigation layout and other help that is available through their websites. And I saw that I think we had a question come up. Let me see here. So it looks like we have a uh, Catherine. Hey, Catherine, you should be um, able to talk now. But you may need to unmute on your end. Um, hi, I'm using Catherine's, my wife, her uh, laptop. OK. So my question is this, um, when considering to building a new home on an empty lot, when should you get a landscape um, architect involved? So um, if you're building a new home on an empty lot where there hasn't been um, developer installed landscaping or irrigation? Yes, that's the situation. Okay, um, depending on the size of the lot, it may fall under the model water efficient landscape ordinance, but there is a, um, a sizing component to that. Um, and that would be, there's a number of different um, oh, information that applies, you know, in, in um, setting up, uh, you know, the irrigation system and filling out different information that would be submitted to the city, but that's usually it's fairly large lots for that. Um, bringing in a landscape designer, um, I would say you want to bring that in probably before you're putting your irrigation system in so that you have someone who can look at the site and look at the layout for the irrigation. Uh, you, it's kind of, they go hand in hand, that irrigation and the planting plan, 
um, if you put the plants in and you don't have an idea of how you're going to lay out the irrigation, then you might be, you know, digging things up again, and that's going to be an issue. But if you don't have an idea of the plants that you might want or a design already in mind, when you put the irrigation in, you may have the wrong type of irrigation for the site. So probably before you really start doing much of that work on the site is they might be able to also do some of that soil testing to make sure that the soil is looking okay and suggest if you need anything added to the soil like compost um, to help enrich the soil. So I'd say fairly early on in that process. Um, another, um, uh, the Yolo County Master Gardeners are a good resource to talk with kind of about some of the more detailed questions when we get into kind of the landscape design and layout. Um, so we can always have you reach out to us and we can provide you the contact um, phone number for uh, the master gardeners, and they might be able to provide some more specific advice for your property and your individual situation. Thank you. So uh, irrigation in the fall and winter, uh, landscape water needs decrease in the fall with the cooler weather. Um, there's less evapotranspiration, which is the loss of water to the atmosphere through evaporation transpiration of plants. Um, during the November to February time period, we typically recommend that irrigation is uh, shortened by uh, shortening the watering cycles or eliminating a watering day or two each week. Now that we have the two day per week irrigation, if you were watering three days, you need to reduce it to two. If you're watering five, you still need to reduce it to two if you're using that sprinkler spray irrigation. Um, if it rains, then irrigation systems should be off for at least 48 hours after a rain event. And that is a statewide recommendation. Um, and it's based on, uh, at least for our area, we look at about a quarter of an inch of rain. So we're not talking about there's a light sprinkle um, there might still be irrigation needs if there's a light sprinkle, but a heavy rainstorm like recently, um, then we want to try to make sure that those irrigation systems are off so we aren't watering in the middle of like a major, you know, rain event. Okay, next slide. We don't want to forget uh, tree watering because it's a little bit different from some of the other um, watering that we have is really for tree watering, you're looking at watering less frequently and encouraging deep roots. So even some of your drip systems, if you need to water um, some of your other plants more frequently, then you're still probably going to want to have your trees on either a separate line or to do some hand watering of those trees. Um, overhead spray is not a great option for tree watering because uh, that spray, if it hits the, uh, the tree tree trunk can cause rotting and other issues with the tree and the roots. Um, so until it begins raining consistently, so we, we did have, you know, a decent amount of water, so your trees might not need a little bit of water for, you know, a week or two, but if it, things dry out more, then you still want to have young trees getting about 10 gallons of water once a week. Um, and that's approximately like a I'm talking about like maybe a four or five minute shower worth of water. And uh, mature trees you supp need supplemental water about once per month during the hot and dry weather through the prolonged heat waves like we had this last summer when they needed to be watered about twice per month. And we have additional information on tree watering and care on the city's urban forestry pages and the Tree Davis website. And next Wednesday, we have a um, we have a workshop with Tree Davis on tree selection, watering, and care, and they'll be getting more into the details of tree watering and the different methods that you can use. Another consideration for your site would be gray water, especially if you're planning out, you, um, like we, uh, one of the um, commenters mentioned, you know, they're planning a new landscape. If you're also building a new home, one consideration would be gray water. So gray water, the most typical type we see are laundry to landscape systems. Um, at first, kind of what is gray water? Um, is some of you may be familiar with it and others may not, is untreated wastewater that's not contaminated. So it can be wastewater from bathtubs, showers, bathroom sinks, and clothes washers. It does not include kitchen sinks or dishwashers. The reason for that in California right now, and this is uh, statewide, is um, due to potential contaminants like E. coli and other things like rinsing meat or things might go into the sink and the or come off of things in the dishwasher that might be a contaminant and cause issues within the lines or bacteria growth. 
So lawn drain and landscape systems typically don't require a permit, but there are some limitations. There's no spray irrigation. It needs to all be um, sub, uh, soil subsurface irrigation. You can't allow ponding on your property. It can't flow onto like your neighbor's property and it's for exterior use only. Uh, you can view um, a past gray water presentation at savedaviswater.org. Uh, the city does, I believe it's been four annual gray water presentations with different focuses in partnership with Cool Davis, and those are all available on our website. We move to the next slide. So if you're interested in encouraging beneficial insects on your, or beneficial species and insects, pollinators in particular on your site, you can consider pollinator plants that encourage bees, butterflies, and birds. Another advantage of those plants is that they're often very colorful. So if you're looking for a color in your landscape, then um, often those species that are available locally that do well in our local area also happen to be colorful and pollinator friendly. Um, it's good to know your kind of good versus bad bugs on your site, like ladybugs can help control aphids, so you can do some kind of natural, um, you know, uh, pest monitoring on your site or, you know, potentially by encouraging those pollinator species be able to reduce some of the other species that can come in as pests. Um, install bat or uh, uh, barn owl boxes. Bats can keep insect um, numbers under control and barn owls can help to control rodent populations. I would also add that it's um, knowing the difference between um, all the life cycle stages of a good bug versus a bad bug, because um, like baby yes. ladybugs, they look like some sort of a nasty bug that's going to eat everything in your garden. Well, they're, they're actually just eating the aphids, but knowing what those bugs look like, because they don't like a baby ladybug doesn't always look like a ladybug. Mm -hmm. So knowing what they look like throughout their entire developmental stage is important. So my recommendation is if you see a bug in your garden, don't squish it <laughs> until you know what it is, because it might be there to eat the bugs that are eating your plants. And that is, that's um, very true that it's um, the, um, some of the, the stages of the, the beneficial insects aren't what you would expect them to look like. Um, especially like she was saying with the ladybugs, um, if you have kids, ask your kid, because my son was very familiar with the ladybug cycle and was like, oh, that's a ladybug larva. He knew exactly what it was when he was about six years old. Um, so uh, um, definitely looking them up to make sure you can also, like I mentioned with the master gardeners, the master gardeners have familiarity with a lot of the, the different insects in the area. So being able to, you know, contact them, if you had a question on what you're seeing, take a picture, you might be able to email it to them and they might be able to assist. So um, mulch is very important for, it has lots of benefits, but it's particularly important uh, with water conservation on your landscape. It increases soil water retention. So it can reduce a lot of the evaporation um, in the summertime and keep that water in your soil where the plants need it. Um, helps keep the soil and plants roots cool. It also helps to keep dirt on site and out of the storm drains. Uh, it can reduce weed if you, weeds if you have a um, deep enough layer of mulch. And, um, you want to keep it um, on site. You want to try to retain that mulch on site for multiple reasons. We don't want it kind of washing into the storm drain, but it's also there to protect your plants. And if you don't have a way to kind of keep it on site, then you're going to end up um, with all of that work that you've done on bringing the mulch in and doing all that great work with your landscape of not having that benefit of it protecting your landscape anymore. So you can do that. Um, we saw in one of the pictures, there was the border that was um, you know placed kind of the low border around the edge. You can do kind of plant borders that are, you know, will hold the, um, the mulch back. You can dig just a shallow, um, you know, trench along like the side um, to, to keep so that the mulch would flow into there instead of flowing over, you know, a sidewalk or into a storm drain. A four inch layer of mulch is, is a good amount of mulch to be able to suppress weeds and have these other benefits. Um, and you want to avoid having mulch right up against the tree trunk. You can create kind of, and uh, they'll get back, get more into this with the, the tree care next week, but you can create kind of like a donut around your tree trunk, but you don't want the mulch to actually be touching the tree trunk itself because that can lead to retaining moisture against the trunk. So the same issue with the spray irrigation, but you can end up with rotting and other issues, but you know, um, fungal growth with the tree. Now, um, Jennifer is going to be um, taking over from here. Might look real quick and just see if we've got any questions. Mm 
and I wasn't sure if um, under um, Catherine, if you still had a question or if that was from the earlier question. Let me um, give you permission to talk here. Okay, so under Catherine Frank, you should have permission to talk now. I think his hand, the hand was just still raised from the last time. Okay, then I'll go ahead and lower the hand here. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and continue. So um, one of the things that I like to do in my own garden when I'm trying to think about how to make it as sustainable as possible, of course, my focus you know, with the city is, is waste reduction, recycling, composting and stuff. So in the vein of waste reduction, if we're talking about sustainable landscaping, I don't like to bring brand new materials into my garden unless I need to. I mean, there's certain things we have, absolutely have to, you know, I, I, um, but whenever possible um, in my landscaping, I like to try to bring in reused materials. So for example, fencing that's blown down. Um, using, uh, as you can see in the picture here, that, that is um, fencing material from a broken fence that's, that's being used to make um, a vegetable garden bed. Using mulch from straw bales that have molded that uh, you know, feed stores can't really use anymore. It's because they're moldy hay, well that makes fantastic mulch. Um, using uh, wooden pallets to make composting bins. Um, there's a lot of great ways that you can take items that, that would seem like they're not really useful anymore and make them into new products. Um, so the Yolo County Landfill has a lot of fantastic resources um, that you can tap into if you're interested in, in trying out some of these kind of reuse options. Um, so they, uh, when people bring loads of construction material to the Landfill Recycling Center, um, they pull out the lumber and you can buy reused lumber for like $3 for a two by four that's 10 foot long, which if you've seen the price of lumber these days, that's pretty fantastic. So you're using recycled materials, like reused materials, repurposing them for something else. It's a great way to kind of close that recycling group and, loop and have a, uh, have a green garden. Um, the, you can also get wood chips if you're looking for mulch. You know, you can definitely go, you know, to a landscape supply store and, and buy some mulch. Um, you can also contact local arborists to get an entire truckload of chips dropped in your driveway. Um, chat with your neighbors. Um, you know, most folks that are, it's hard to say no to a bunch of uh, wood chips if you're a gardener. So um, check in with your neighbors and see if they'd be interested in um, kind of going in with you and, and using all those chips because it's a lot of chips that they'll drop, but you can get quite a bit of it that way. And then you've got some free mulch for your yard. Um, other things that you can do to, to think about reusing materials, you know, using a plastic, uh, a plastic jug, um, if it's clear or opaque, you can cut the bottom of that off and you've got a little greenhouse that you can put over some small plants or seedlings if the weather's going to be too cold. Um, using newspaper, folding it to make little cups to, to plant some seedlings. There's a lot of different things that you could do in your garden. And I love seeing pictures and ideas of things like these, you know, go to thrift stores, the landfill thrift store, they have building materials there. They've got all sorts of interesting things that you could, you know, take it and reuse. So, um, so I, I'd urge you to be creative, see what else you can do instead of going and buying brand new things to create structure in your garden. What else could you use to kind of create uh, a green garden? Um, the other thing, you know, and Dawn was talking about uh, when you're choosing plants, it is so essential when you're choosing a plant to make sure you're picking the right plant for the right place. And, and Dawn definitely hit on that. You, you need to look at the plant for the water needs. You need to look for how big it's going to grow. And I emphasize this, how big it's going to grow. Because so often we see uh, situations where plants are overgrowing a sidewalk. Well, why are they overgrowing a sidewalk? Because they're too big. A plant is going to grow to its specified size. I see these plants, these vining plants regularly planted along sidewalks. Well, those plants, they grow to 10, 12 feet and they're planted one foot away from the sidewalk. Well, what that means is you're out there clipping that plant back every week during the growing season. Otherwise you could just say goodbye to your sidewalk. So think about how large that plant is gonna go, is gonna grow because not only is this gonna take a lot of your time in trying to manage this plant's growth, but then you're also having to deal with all that waste that comes from clipping that plant. So if you think about um, your soil as a, think about your soil as a bank, okay? So as your plant is growing, it's drawing from that bank all the nutrients and the materials that's in that bank to help it to grow, okay? So as we're trimming our plants and pruning it, we're removing that material from the system entirely. So that bank account of, of nutrients in the soil is gonna continually drop. And unless we incorporate that material back into the soil as compost and spreading compost, 
and returning that the nutrients to the ground and you know putting more uh, infusion in the bank we're going to have a problem so if you have a plant that's too large and you're constantly having to prune it you need to think about the fact that you're going to have to be adding those resources back to your soil bank eventually so think about where you're planting your plant how big is it going to grow you also don't want it to look awful like these fantastic <laughs> images here of a tree that was planted right below a power line and if you look around look around you'll see this kind of stuff and you're like why did they plant that tree there because you know that tree is going to grow large the power pole was probably already there when that tree was planted or this beautiful bougainvillea bush and it, it's just right next to a driveway and they have to prune it because otherwise you couldn't park your cars there. So here's the result is you have this shorn side of the bougainvillea. So think about where you're planting things. Um, while we all like our landscapes to go from zero to 100% you know, perfection immediately, if you're selecting plants that grow slowly, you're also not gonna have this issue with having to continually prune and manage the waste that comes from the pruning. So keep that in mind. Um, and then of course, my favorite thing is, is just leafing things on site. Okay. We like to say, just leaf it alone. If you have a tree and it's dropping leaves, just leaf it alone. Um, it, as the, tr as a tree sheds leaves, the leaves will fall to the ground and create a natural mulch for that tree. And, and that's an essential part of, of a tree's life because the tree needs mulch. And if we leave those leaves on site, it allows the tree to do its natural, um, its natural recycling right on site. And the, the leaves will break down and it'll go back into the soil bank and build up the nutrient level again. So the best thing you can do for your trees is leave the leaves where they are. And I know that totally goes against the grain of what we like to see in our yard, but it's, it's important. Um, if you have a lawn and these leaves are falling onto your lawn, don't worry. You can mulch mow them into the ground. So you set your lawnmower on the mulch setting. Don't bag it up. Just run that mower over your leaves once, sometimes twice a week if you have a lot of leaves falling. The mulch mower will chop the leaves up into such tiny pieces that you won't really see them anymore. They'll fall in between the layers of grass and then they'll decompose on site and again, replenish that soil bank. bank. Um, you can also use yard trimmings as mulch. I've done this as you're pruning things, chop them up into just really small pieces and then just drop them on the ground right under a bush because then it, again, it's building up that mulch layer. It's returning the nutrients into the soil bank. And I'm a huge, huge fan of backyard composting. Um, we had a class last week on backyard composting. It, the uh, recording of the webinar has been posted online. Um, so you can go and take a look at that. Um, backyard composting is a fantastic way to ensure that you have a sustainable garden. Sorry, my computer's freezing slightly, so hopefully I'll be able to go to the next slide here. Um, the other thing you want to talk about uh, managing yard materials is, of course, what to do with the yard materials um, once you have them coming out of your yard. So, you know, here in Davis, we have the ability to um, put yard materials in our organic carts every single week. And those materials are brought to a local composting facility and where they are turned into um, compost. So filling up your brown loaded organics cart with uh, yard materials is a fantastic way to make sure that they go into a composting system and are returned into the soil. Um, if you have more material than will fit into your organics cart, um, I recommend that you consider um, chopping the material up a little bit smaller before you place it into the organics cart um, because that makes it uh, Fit more materials and I apologize I'm trying to go to the next slide but my computer is sort of freezing on me right now um so if you if you fill up your organics cart and you wait a few days the material will often sort of settle down to the bottom of the cart and then that allows you to squish the material down a bit and then um you can have uh more space to put more material in there it looks like I might have just completely lost my screen here not quite sure why, trying to get that back up. The other thing that you can do is you can always ask your neighbor if they have any space in their yard material cart. If your, um, your organics cart is too full, you can ask them if they have any more um, space so that you can share, you know, put some of your stuff in there. Never, of course, do that without asking, but if they have some space and they're, they're willing to share, that's, that's always a nice option for you. Um, if you have more material than can fit into your cart, you just absolutely do not have any more space. Um, there are other options and I'm trying to get the presentation back and I just don't know what happened to it here. Don, I might need you to open up the file and try sharing because I can't seem to get it back. 
I don't know what happened to it. Can you still see it? No, I'm trying to share my screen now. I'm so sorry about this. Okay. I believe you should now be seeing my screen and I will go to. Okay, thank you, Don. My apologies. Technology is fantastic and it works. I believe we're on the resources page. Almost. We're one more up, well, two more up than that. It was right. There we go. Okay. Um, so use your organics card as much as you can, because that material does go to a local composting facility, actually, that's located at the landfill. They have a composting facility there. Um, your service in your yard waste, uh, your organics card is serviced every week. You can get additional carts if you want to. Um, and I think I covered the rest of that. So yeah, go ahead to the next slide. Thank you, Don. Um, so other options are available. If you've got more material, then it'll fit into your cart. Of course, right now, you know, it, it's October. So we have the um, on-street yard material pickup for um, most of Davis uh, has access to that service. It's every other week. Um, but there's other options too. And one I like to mention because it's kind of fun. The Sacramento Zoo has a lot of animals that eat <laughs> green waste and there's specific types of trees and brush that they look for to feed their animals. And if you happen to have those kinds of trees or bushes, it's kind of a fun way that you could grow stuff to feed you know, to feed the animals at the zoo. So if that interests you, you can go to look on the zoo's website. They have a lot of information about how to donate your green materials to feed the giraffes and such. It's kind of fun. I mean, who wouldn't want to feed a koala? Um, the other options that you, of course, could have you know, extra material hauled away um, from your yard. If you have too many yard, too much yard you know, trimmings and you can't handle it. Um, but as much as possible, I, I urge people to try to find ways to keep that material on site. Again, you want to have those yard trimmings after you've removed them from your plants you want that to go back into the ground to um, feed the soil again you want to replenish that soil bank um, next slide and i think that is pretty much the end of our our presentation thank you for um sticking with us through our uh our uh technology woes. We have a lot of information on our website about green gardening under greenerdavis.org. Um, it's just a short link to a City of Davis webpage where we have um, a lot of information about all the different things that we've talked about, plus links to even more information um, on all aspects of green gardening. Um, DavisRecycling.org is where you would go to find information about composting specifically and yard material management. Um, Dawn has a lot of wonderful information on SaveDavisWater.org um, about how to save water. All these links that she mentioned um, that are, are on those web pages as well. So we've got a lot of information and we'll be sharing this presentation as well. So you can see these, these web pages and, and go there to find more information. I also wanna put a plug in for our monthly um, newsletter, Greener Davis, that goes out once a month. Um, it's packed full of Davis specific um, information about all things sustainable. So whatever is going on, whatever the new topics are, you'll hear about it first if you get our e-newsletter. Um, it, it's, a, it's a great way to stay connected with your local community and to know what's happening environmentally. So if you're not already signed up for the Greener Davis newsletter, um, if you go to our Greener Davis Facebook page, there's a link on the home page there to sign up for it. Um, you can also contact us, email us, um, and we'd be happy to send you the link to, to sign up for the Greener Davis newsletter. And then if we have any questions, I think I saw that there was a raised hand. Uh, Jennifer, are you able to see the raised hands can't with the screen sharing? I cannot. Everything has gone blank on my screen. Let me stop share then. Then I should be able to view. Oh, there we go. Barbara Hartz has her hand up, it looks like. Yes. Okay. Hey, Barbara, you should be able to talk now. Okay. Hi, how are you today? Good. How are you? Good. Um, I have mulch on my yards. Both of them are covered with mulch. And um, I also have leaves dropping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is it better to leave the leaves on top of the mulch or to put them in a mulcher and mulch them? You know, that's kind of your personal preference. It's fine to leave them on top of the mulch. You just basically have another layer of mulch on top of your mulch. Um, if you have a way to shred those leaves up, um, that you know, the smaller you chop things up, the faster they decompose. 
So if you're looking for, you know, a more aesthetic look and you don't like the look of the leaves, that definitely will make the leaves disappear faster. Um, but there's nothing wrong with leaving the leaves on top of the mulch um, as far as, you know, the plant growth goes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. There are a few types of trees that have some, um, uh, it's not allelopathic, but I can't remember the, the technical name for the chemicals, but there are some trees that produce some certain chemicals in their leaves that suppress growth underneath the trees. I'm thinking like, you know, certain oaks, certain pine trees, you notice they, or eucalyptus, there's, there's nothing growing underneath them. The trees are really good at suppressing plant growth underneath them. For, so that would be the only case when I would say, maybe you don't want to lose those, leave those leaves on site. Um, but if you notice that you've got plants growing and they're just fine growing underneath, you know, that tree, then they're probably not having a problem with those leaves. Um, if you're struggling to get stuff growing underneath those trees, then that's when I would be concerned about leaving those leaves. But again, things like oaks don't like a lot of summer water and you could kill them if you're watering plants underneath an oak tree, you can lose your oak tree. So just things to keep in mind. Yeah, another tree that um, that you might want to avoid the leaves from are black walnuts. If you happen oh, to yeah. have any black walnuts, um, they don't. Uh, they, I think, I think they are aleopathic, and they will um, actually keep plants from suppress plant growth underneath them. Okay, I have a lot of pine needles, and I've been picking up the pine needles, so I hate pine needles. <laughs> <laughs> The pine needles are falling from the city of Davis tree too, which is oh. we back up against the bike trail. So there's not much I can do about getting rid of the pine tree. But thank you so much for all your information. I appreciate it. You're welcome. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand. So we will be posting um, the recording of this um, class on our website along with the presentation and you know all the links and such. Um, so we will be posting that to the greenerdavis.org webpage under the uh, workshop links so that um, anyone who's interested can watch the presentation again, share it with a friend, check out all the resources that were mentioned, um, and then feel free to reach out to us anytime if you have questions. Um, both Don and I can be reached through um, the PW web. So mm -hmm. PW web at cityofdavis.org. We'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Have a nice day. <laughs>